Gospel, mm, verses 26 to 38, the birth of Jesus is announced. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent an angel Gabriel to a town in Galilee named Nazareth. He had a message for a young woman promised in marriage to a man named Joseph, who was a descendant of King David. Her name was Mary. The angel came to her and said, Peace be with you. The Lord is with you, and he has greatly blessed you. Mary was deeply troubled by the angel's message, and she wondered what the words meant. The angel said to her, Don't be afraid, Mary. God has been gracious to you. You will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High God. The Lord will make him a king, as his ancestor David was. And he will be king of the descendants of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will never end. Mary said to the angel, I am a virgin, how can this be? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. God's power will rest upon you. For this reason, the Holy Child will be called the Son of God. Remember your relative Elizabeth? It it is said that she cannot have children, but she herself is now in the sixth month of pregnancy, even although she is very old, for there is nothing that God cannot do. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it happen to you as you have said. And the angel left her. The reading this morning might have seemed a bit strange given the fact that it's one we normally would use at Christmas time. But um, I've been thinking, as some of you would be aware, of the Apostles' Creed recently. And of course, a couple of weeks ago, I started with the first part, which is, I believe in God, the Father, Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth. And then it goes on, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, (coughs) was crucified, dead and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose from the dead. And uh, thinking about that, I thought, do I really believe in Jesus Christ? Well, I know I believe in God. Do I believe that this individual, Jesus, as we call him, is indeed the only begotten Son of God? And I notice in a lot of versions today, they are dropping out the word begotten, which is a bit unfortunate in a way because... I do believe in Jesus. I do believe that he is indeed the only begotten Son of God. While you and I may be sons and daughters, or if you will, children of God, he is the only one that was begotten. That is, the Holy Spirit, using the biblical terminology, came upon the Virgin Mary and she conceived and brought forth the Son, our Lord, And of course, that has always been one of the troublesome teachings of Christianity and particularly since the latter part of the 1800s and they produced the Revised Standard Version of the Bible and they carefully uh, removed the word virgin and so it just became a young woman (coughs) which made it a bit nonsensical in a way because if Jesus was born in the the conventional way, male and female, then he was not the Son of God. He could not have died for your sins and mine, so the whole story just falls over. So Jesus Christ then was born of the Virgin Mary, as the scriptures have taught us. And Luke, the doctor, gives us that really um, interesting account of the dialogue that took place between Mary, or Miriam as her real name was, and the angel Gabriel. As you read the dialogue, 
it's doubtful really that this uh, young woman was just 14 or 15 or so years old as the Roman Catholic Church would have us believe because it would be unusual for a youngster to be able to talk like that. The dialogue indicates an older person. But whatever she was, she was a virgin and uh, the Holy Spirit came upon her, she conceived, she brought forth the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what the Bible teaches, that is what Christianity for 2,000 years has taught and you can find the same teaching in the Old Testament that there would be a, a virgin would conceive and bring forth a son and he would be the saviour of the world, the son of God. So our Lord Jesus Christ then is indeed the son of God and he's the only begotten son of God. For well, you and I may have been adopted into the family He is the firstborn, physically born son of God. And it's one of those strange things that as the scripture says, in the beginning was the word or in the beginning was Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ was with God and Jesus Christ was God. The same Jesus Christ was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Jesus Christ and without without Jesus Christ there was nothing made that was made. So, this then child that was born to the Virgin Mary is in fact God Almighty. And this brings us to that teaching of the Trinity, again, that we're all familiar with and which is so hard for so many of us to understand. For the Bible tells us, John tells us, that no man has seen God at any time. That he the Son of God who came down to us has declared God to us. So on the one hand we are told that Jesus is God, on the other hand we are told that uh, no man has seen God at any time. Well I think this must mean that no God has seen, nobody has seen God in his entirety. No one has seen him as God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. The Son reveals God to us. And when we think of the Holy Spirit, our Lord Jesus, later on in the Gospel of John, speaking of the Holy Spirit, said that he would send another comforter, the Spirit, to us and that comforter would be like he was. In other words, he would be identical with Christ. There would be no difference. So we have the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit, God complete. Nobody has seen God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit as individuals. We have simply seen our Lord Jesus Christ who has revealed God the Father to us. He came to our world as we know, born, he lived. In the course of time, after preaching and proclaiming God's truth, he was condemned and crucified, dead and buried. Then there's a contentious verse, if you will, from the Apostles' Creed. He descended into hell. There are many Christians who reject that thought, absolutely completely reject it. They say that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and so he did. But death passed to all men as punishment for Adam's sin. Death is what we inherit from Adam as a result of Adam's sin. But heaven and hell are the reward and punishment for our own sin. So, if we do that which is right in God's sight, our reward is heaven. If we do that which is evil in God's sight, our reward is hell. That's straightforward enough. We all understand that. Jesus not only died for us, 
but he also went to hell for us. So whilst our punishment or our deeds may deserve hell, we can rest assured that we don't have to go there, we won't go there because someone has been there before us and took our punishment upon himself. So the punishment was not only death on the cross but it was also going down to hell for us and by so doing he delivered us from the fear of hell. We will all die except for those of us who may be alive when the Lord comes back but we need not fear what happens after that. For to those who love the Lord and have committed themselves to his care and keeping, seeking his forgiveness and mercy, we have the assurance, the blessed assurance, that we will go to be with the Lord. As St. Paul taught us, when you are absent from the body, you are present with the Lord. Therefore, the Christian has no fear not only no fear of death, but no fear of hell. There is always in most of us a fear of the unknown. And as the old song says, everyone wants to go to heaven but nobody wants to die. And there is truth in that, of course. Very few of us particularly want to die. But the man or the woman or the child even who gives themselves over to Jesus Christ can step forward boldly knowing that whatever happens the Lord will not leave them, will not forsake them, will not depart from them but he will be with them all of the way even into the next life, death. I've been intrigued in talking to people who reject the whole thing of Christianity. They just won't believe it and yet they have said that they can't deny that there is a supernatural world. There is something, as it were, out there. They would like to deny it, but they simply can't because all of their experiences, that which they have read, that which they have heard and that which they themselves have seen, indicate that there is a spirit world, if you want to call it that. And that these people really are fooling themselves. There is indeed a spirit world out there. In fact, there are two sections. There is that which is of God and that which has been committed over to the devil. And the devil is also a very real being. And I believe in him as much as I believe in Jesus Christ. And he is seeking to confuse and to denounce and to distract and to lead man astray because the one thing that the devil hates is man and the reason he hates man is not because mankind has done anything to him but he hates man because one, God loves man and two, because God gives man a second chance. When the devils fell from heaven, as it were, when they rebelled against God, for there was a time when they were angels, when they rebelled against God, they were cast out of heaven and some of them came to this earth. Others were imprisoned in an, in an abyss where they are chained until the appropriate time. That's another story. But these devils or fallen angels have no way of repentance. They were higher beings than mankind and they knew better. So they cannot, re they would not repent or they were not given that opportunity of repenting. Man on the other hand through the wonderful grace of God has been given the chance again and again and again of repenting of their sin. But there is a solemn warning in scripture where it says the spirit will not always strive with man. There's coming a time when God will call in the accounts. There's coming a time 
when we won't be able to play around with the faith anymore. We have to make our decisions and be prepared to stand firmly. The world in which you and I live has changed dramatically from when we were young. We all know that. It's not the same world. The values have changed. Things have been twisted and turned around. And the world is plunging into deep spiritual darkness. There is still a lot of spirituality, but it is now turning toward the dark side of things. And I said before that God sent John to be a witness in the world. And after the time of John, then the Lord established the church to be the witness in the world. And the church is dramatically, drastically, dreadfully failing. We're living in a time when we are seeing a rise of almost of anti-church. It began in the 1800s with the coming of the false cults. Now, there have always been false cults, but these were major moves of the devil. And we began to see things like Mormonism and Jehovah's Witnessism and um, a lot of these other pseudo-Christian cults. Good people deceived and being led astray led into hopes of a false security. There was darkness poured out upon the land and the church has drastically failed. It is little wonder that many of our churches lie empty. It is little wonder that so many of our young people are being swept away. We have turned to the worship of the old nature gods. We have stepped back 2,000 years. The moral values of today are not dissimilar to the moral values that was facing the fledgling church in the Roman world. Our spiritual ancestors had the courage and the faith to stand up against the filth and the corruption of Roman society. And eventually they won through until they also, of course, were corrupted, as history tells us. We are now living in a time when the old nature gods have been lifted up before us and given different names. If you look at the superheroes which you can often see on television programs these days, the Supermans, the Batmans, the Spidermans, the Aquaman, the Wonder Woman, all of them have their parallels in Mount Olympus, the ancient gods of Greece. If you look at the Green Movement today, you will see the parallel to the god Bacchus and the other nymphs and dryads of the forest. I don't have a problem with the desire to save the world. I just have a problem with the fact that the spirit driving a lot of this stuff is straight out of hell. And it's evil. The desire to do good, the desire to do right, is admirable and we should support it and encourage it. But the spirit that is driving a lot of these organisations is absolutely anti-Christian. If we go back to the, river, uh, to the book of Genesis, we're told by God to look after the world and uh, to replenish it as we go. There are some who teach When you look at the word replenish, it implies or suggests that there had been a world before that had been destroyed and now it was man's task to rebuild and to restore and to renew. 
And perhaps that's right. But our task is to preach the gospel. Our task is to be a light in the world of darkness in which we live and to bring people the knowledge, the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the one who came as a virgin, uh, born of a virgin, the one who was called the Son of God and who is the Saviour of the world, the one in whom the Gentiles, that's us, would trust. Well, now he has come. He is very much in the world. He is very much alive and well. And there are still churches that are preaching and proclaiming the word. But there are many that have given up the struggle and have failed. Some have closed their doors. Some have gone over to the enemy and introduced things that were never allowed in the Bible. If God demanded holiness of life from an Old Testament Jew, does he then expect anything less from a New Testament Christian? Surely not. The expectation of God is that we will give ourselves completely and absolutely to him and be guided by him. We will have failures, we will have failings, we will have our own foibles and fantasies, but we give our lives to Jesus Christ, for he is the saviour of the world, and he was not only crucified, dead and buried, but he descended into hell on our behalf, took on uh, himself the punishment of sin, which is hell, and then rose again. And in that resurrection gave us the promise of eternal life, the promise that we too will rise from the grave and that in the course of time we will meet with him and with other saints, those who have gone before us and those who rise with us. We will all meet together in the clouds in the sky and thus shall we ever be with the Lord. And what a marvellous, amazing promise. And I look back and I look into the lives of some of these saintly souls, just some that I've, I've known here and uh, others I've known around this district who have passed on and their lives of testimony, their lives of commitment, their lives of faith. It's been absolutely amazing. And to see this from the far north and right down to the bottom of the South Island and in the islands where I've attended funerals and heard of the saints of the Lord committed to Jesus Christ. Their lives were drastically, dramatically changed and they gave themselves completely to him, rejecting all others, rejecting all other gods, goddesses, all things that were not of God. And this is what God is calling on us to do in this world because this is a time. This is a time when the church must stand and be counted or be swallowed up. Denominations, one after another, are yielding to ungodly, unwholesome, downright wicked things. They are allowing that which is wrong into their teachings and into their churches. They are changing the Bible. They are twisting the scriptures, making them say things they never ever said. For 2,000 years, the Bible has not been tampered with. Fundamentally, it's remained the same. Now, in today's world, our arrogant, conceited generation has taken it upon themselves to know better than God and they have begun to alter the word of God. I don't know how far back it was, but as I said, in the Revised Standard Version, when they brought that out in the late 1800s, and they took out the fact that Mary was a virgin, that was one of the first major attacks. 
and Christian ministers all over the world, particularly in the United States, gathered all the revised standard versions they could get and burnt them. They would not accept a travesty of God's word. They would not accept such a false teaching. Today, the church has many different versions and many of them are just as erroneous as the Revised Standard Version was in that one instance. And now we accept them. Now nobody knows. Now hardly anybody takes it. It doesn't matter. Well, we need to get back to the Word of God, the faith for today and the hope for tomorrow. We need to stand on God's Word and refuse to compromise because the times are going to get even worse than they are now. And the church is going to sink lower and lower in the eyes of many. If we stand for righteousness, if we stand for truth, we simply are doing what God has told us to do. If we compromise, we fail in our witness, in our testimony. The thing that we must always ask ourselves, as we do when we have communion, how do we stand with God? Is my heart right with God? I've looked at this man, Jesus, and I believe. I believe the Bible to be the inspired word of God. I'm not so silly as to say there are not mistakes in the Bible because I know there are historical dates that are wrong in the Bible. But the story of Jesus Christ is absolutely true. The fact that he was born of a virgin is absolutely true. I have absolutely no doubt of that, that he was crucified, dead, buried, went to hell, rose again. I have no doubt. The word of God is the way, the truth and the life. It leads us to Jesus, it leads us to salvation, it leads us to life eternal. We made a decision somewhere in our lives that we would follow Jesus. The temptations are very great. We are told, whether it's true or not, I've never really found out, we are told that many of those people who get swept up into cults are people who actually do have some knowledge of the scripture. And that's an absolute tragedy if it's so. Perhaps it's their own fault. They should have known more about the word of God. Perhaps it's the fault of the church for not providing adequate Bible studies. Perhaps it's the fault of the preachers for not preaching the word. I don't know. But what I do know is I don't want to be among the lost. I want to be saved. I want to go to heaven. And I want to accept the offer which Jesus has made. He said that he would be prepared to take the responsibility for my sins on himself if I will but ask him. And so I would invite each of you here tonight, today to consider, is your heart right with God? It's a very simple matter. That was what Jehovah's Witness man shouted at me. That's the trouble with you born again people. You make it so easy. It is easy. Jesus is there. That's an old American song said, standing somewhere in the shadows you'll find Jesus. He's the one who always cares and understands. Standing somewhere in the shadows you'll find him and you'll know him by the nail prints in his hands. Jesus is there this morning offering to each and every one of us a full, rich salvation and eternal life if we will but commit ourselves to him. Just a matter of asking him again into our heart. Is your heart right with God this morning? I'm sure it is, but only you know. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, merciful and mighty God, in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour, I come to you today. And I do pray that you would pour out your spirit upon all of us, Lord, even as the Holy Spirit came upon the people on the day of Pentecost. 
may we too know that special outpouring, that special blessing. Oh, we don't ask for tongues of fire on our heads. We don't ask to speak in tongues. But what we do ask, Lord, is that our hearts might be made right with God. That, Lord God, you would move and cleanse all our all of us, Lord, from all the dross, from all the sin, from all the darkness, all the doubt and all the uncertainty, and give us again the joy of the Lord. Father, pour out your Spirit upon us, I pray, that we might indeed walk with, walk with our Jesus, our Saviour, yes, our Lord, yes, our God, yes, and our brother, our brother Jesus, who was the only begotten, but we who are the adopted. So, Lord, bless us now, I pray, as we turn our thoughts to you in Jesus' name. Amen.